Gordon. My name is Jesse Chason with Lisa Blanchard as the host of Airing Addiction. I share often my journey started on this campus. Got sober as a client here, just like you. I really do see phenomenal change. Always hope. I've seen situations that on the surface look impossible become possible. Doing this podcast is to share those recovery stories, be honest about what the challenges are and have some real conversations, but kind of share that out on the, the airwaves. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Happy Monday morning. Welcome to another episode of Airing Addiction. So glad everyone's here that's watching on Facebook Live and that'll hear this later on in their favorite podcast app. I've uh, been looking forward to this podcast for a multitude of reasons, both personally and professionally, to get this message of hope out. Uh, just a programming note as we're entering in September, and for those that maybe don't know, September is National Recovery Month, so where we've been averaging, Lisa and I, maybe a podcast, two podcasts a month. We're actually going to podcast every week in Recovery Month, so we'll we'll be doing one a week, be on the lookout for that. Uh, but today we are actually talking about something that's coming up next week, Overdose Awareness Day. And it's a bit of a somber subject. Uh, it touches a lot of those uh, in recovery that work with the recovery field. So today we have just a wonderful panel of guests to discuss this subject and to discuss how that the message of hope is getting out to those who need it the most. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Jesse. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. We're getting quite comfortable with having a little bit of a bigger panel and having a broader discussion. So I'm really excited for our guests um, to join us today. And as and as Jesse said, this is a, a tough topic, right? It's, um, you know, a, a difficult, um, you know, concept to to talk about um, for us all, and um, you know, it's it's easier for us in the recovery space to talk about the the recovery stories, right? It's easier for us to to share um, when things go well, um, and it's harder, you know, to talk about the losses. But we need to talk about the losses, and so that's why we felt it was really important to have this episode today, um, and really to talk about the reality of the impact of loss, both in our treatment community, right, our staff that are faced with this um, across all levels of care, across the country, everywhere, um, all of the time, but especially um, the loved ones, um, and really recognizing that every single um, statistic that is shared often at this time of year is, is a person, right, with, um, you know, really um, wonderful value and significance in loved ones around them. And this is an opportunity to recognize each and every one of those individuals who we have lost um, to this disease of addiction and to overdose. So I do, you know, welcome folks as you're listening. Um, if this is a tough topic, do what you need to do to take care of yourselves, press pause, um, you know, do th do whatever you need to do to support yourself um, in, in this conversation really today and, and every day, right, in this um, in this challenging work. But with that, um, I'd really love to introduce our guests today. Um, so I'll introduce kind of all of you and then I'll let you kind of introduce yourselves. So just figure that might be a little bit easier. So kind of on the uh, more treatment community side, we're really happy to have Dr. Christian Williams here with us. She's from Assumption University. She's an assistant professor in, in the Department of Human Services and Rehabilitation Studies. Um, and she's the coordinator of the concentration working with children and adolescents in community settings. Um, she's also a uh, licensed and practicing psychotherapist a licensed mental health counselor, and has 18 years of experience working with individuals and families and children in trauma, resilience, grief, and substance use, right? All things that are really relevant to this topic. Um, and I just recently heard her speak at a conference, which prompted this. Um, and so I'd love to have her share some of her perspective on the impacts um, of overdose, you know, on, of course, individuals in the community, but also on those of us that, that choose to work work in this field um, and um, and choose to, to come into work every single day, um, you know, knowing how challenging this can be. Um, and I'm also really happy to have 
with us, um, both Jimmy McRae and Lauren McRae, who are the co-founders of the nonprofit organization Maka's Mission, which seeks to raise awareness about addiction and overdose, reduce the stigma associated with addiction and mental illness, and raise funds for individuals to support their recovery, right? There's the, the hope piece that um, we will continue to talk a bit about. Um, Maka's Mission was founded in 2021 in honor and remembrance of Justin Maka McRae, um, their younger brother. Uh, he was 21 years young when he passed away due to a fentanyl overdose just 10 days before his 22nd birthday. Um, I am not going to say any more because you all can say so much more and that's what we have you here for. Um, and so I wonder if we start um, with you, um, uh, Dr. Williams, if you wouldn't mind just sharing kind of, you know, how, how did you get interested in this, this kind of um, part of clinical work? So, you know, for me, um, I had been working in the field for quite some time and, you know, was running the outpatient department at, at Karen Worcester for a while. And, you know, unfortunately, when fentanyl came on the scene, right, we really started to see, you know, such a significant increase to the losses that we were experiencing in the client that we were seeing, right? And, you know, as I started, you know, teaching full time and still kind of practicing, one of the things that was standing out to me, you know, was this really significant concept of how quickly people were transitioning out of acute settings and into private practice. And, you know, the stress and burnout that they were experiencing, right, in these more acute settings, you know, and it was really creating this kind of almost, you know, dynamic where we had our, you know, recent graduates working with our most acute patients and, you know, people who have been in the field a bit longer, you know, kind of running, <laughs> you know, and in this really kind of stressed way. And so, you know, spending some time really looking at, you know, what were people getting for support? How were they managing, you know, these losses really intrigued me, right? And, you know, got me interested in starting a conversation about, you know, what do we need as practitioners to keep doing this work? And, you know, what is it like on our side and what kind of supports and organizations were doing things out there? So, yeah. And Jimmy and Lauren, would you mind just sharing a little bit about kind of what, of course, um, we'd love to hear your your brother's story as much as you would be comfortable and willing to share. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of losses. What prompted you to, to take that loss and turn it into something? Yeah, I think for us, um, it was just a, such an impactful time, you know, when Justin had passed away and still continues to be. Um, and as a family, we really pulled together and wanted to try and, you know, take this loss, take this story and use it to impact, hopefully impact the lives of others. Um, Justin was a great kid, very young, um, you know, played sports, had a lot of friends, had a lot of interest, um, taking college classes. Um, you know, comes from a, a good family background. And, you know, we wanted to, I guess, use that to show that unfortunately, you know, addic addiction impacts anyone. Um, and, you know, what can we do to put the story out there to reduce the stigma? Um, and, you know, in our minds, if we could even help one other person um, to us, that would make, um, you know, make somewhat of a difference and make something positive come out of such a, a tragic situation. And I, <clears throat> I just want to add to that. I think in Justin's recovery experience, I think us as a family, um, early on, there wasn't much that we knew about in terms of resources and how to stay connected to people and learn from other people's experiences. Uh, but eventually, through different organizations, we found sort of different support systems and a larger community, uh, both for people in recovery and also the families. And at least me personally, and I, I think my family all feels the same way. These were like very important and very helpful in, in providing hope that, that you guys mentioned earlier. And so, you know, on the on the other side of him passing, it really was like, you know, we we felt so much hope and, and comfort and, and and support from these organizations. And I think it was important to uh, kind of contribute and stay connected to those to those organizations and communities that that were helpful to us during that time as well. And that's so important, right? That that level of support. And I think that that's probably going to be a theme that we're going to hear throughout this, right? Because we heard some really talk clearly about there being needing to be layers of support for the treating community who are dealing 
with losses in dealing with, you know, just um, the challenges of working with individuals with substance use disorder, right, on a daily basis, particularly in acute settings, and then families and loved ones need that support too. And so if folks want to go back to our archives too, and, um, you know, there we have a, a lot of episodes really focused on family. Um, and so we've had Maureen Kavanaugh on twice um, from Magnolia Recovery Resources. Um, in fact, because of Maureen's involvement in the podcast, we actually have done two um, large-scale trainings at our organization on her family support model. Um, and we have been running a free, so folks are interested in or listening, or if you're a family member, and this is part of why you listen to this podcast, podcast today and you need some support, um, we do offer a free family um, support group that follows that Magnolia process, um, really coming from the place of family lived experience. Um, and so we have been kind of trained in that model by Maureen directly, and we offer it on Wednesdays um, at 630 in the evening um, and or six. I always get it wrong. <laughs> I know. I always have to remember too. Is it six, six thirty, seven? Six. Yeah. Every Wednesday at six, it's actually six, going six to seven thirty. That's why I get it because I say it wrong. Um, but all you have to do to get on the kind of email list, it's the same link every week. So once you have it, you know you can keep it. But um, it is just to email um, Magnolia at spectrumhealthsystems.org, and you'll be automatically added to the list. So if folks are interested, we can drop it in notes too um, on this podcast. Um, because I think that that's really important, right? And it's important. I think it's I think it's great that you talk about how supportive that was to you, and then staying connected even after um, even after your significant loss. So um, thank you for for sharing that. Is there anything anybody would you know would like to to have those listening right to? To, to know about kind of, you know, overdose awareness, like what are the messages that, you know, the broader community, right, whether they're connected to this directly or not, should know about what, why do we, why do we have a day, right? Why do we have a Remembrance Day? And how should we um, recognize that? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, I think for for me, I would say it's just really important to take a moment and take a time out and remember, you know, all those that we have lost. Um, you know, I remember last year going up to Gloucester um, for their overdose awareness vigil for the first time. And it's just shocking to see how many, you know, luminaries and how many people and family members are there. Um, and as, you know, as beautiful as it is to remember, it's also very, you know, somber to think of um, how many people, you know, these luminaries and pictures and everything else really represents. Um, so I think it's just uh, important to take the time out, um, remember those, and also, you know, remember why. I think that goes along with um, trying to reduce the stigma. Um, and that's one of the things that us as a family at Macca's Mission try to do is, talk about it and be honest, uh, you know, with people about what happened. Um, and I think, you know, just continuing to be honest and, and talk about things is what helps to um, reduce the stigma that's out there. And I think by continuing to reduce that stigma, it's going to, you know, provide more support, more education um, for people and for um, family members, etc. So I think, for me, at least, that's um, one of the why it's so important. That's a great point, Lauren, because I don't care who you are or how insulated you are, you know, uh, addiction has touched everyone's life in one sh way, shape or form, whether, you know, personally or professionally or, you know, um, there's that distant relative that is really disconnected to the family as a whole. But, you know, people know kind of what's going on and just to bring awareness to that. And, and uh, you hit the nail on the head, the stigma. Right. The stigma when, when you were talking about the stigma of those in addiction or those who have uh, passed on from from an, an overdose. Uh, I was also thinking sort of to Dr. Williams research and, and what you had said to open us up the stigma of even working in the field of addiction. I know I, I confront that quite often where, I'm, you know, it, it's it's a common question for someone when they they meet me, you know, hey, what do you do? 
and, and I know that I'm just opening a uh, Pandora's box, if you will. You know, how deep do I want to go with this person? Uh, how much time do I, I want to, you know, talk to? Because I know it's not going to be, you know, a, a simple one word answer. It's going to go deeper than that. And I, I welcome that um, if the person's open to that, to to uh, share and know that, you know, this this is not only a, a passion, but this is necessary. Um, and, and again, that, that word hope, right. That for as, as much as we, um, we struggle and, and Dr. Williams, you were talking about, you know, the sort of newer, um, graduates meet with the most acute settings and then quickly burn out in, in a few months or a few years. Um, there are those people who've made this a career for 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years and to learn from them and what they're pioneering in this field. So it's, it's not only necessary, but it's very refreshing to see as well. And I think it's helpful. And I wonder, um, you know, what what everybody's thoughts are on this. But, you know, for, for those that don't know, J- Jesse was just promoted at our organization. So congratulations, <laughs> Jesse. But he was promoted to clinical supervisor at our um, withdrawal management, our largest um, withdrawal management program in Westboro, right? And so, um, you know, I've um, been doing this for, for a very long time. I've been with Spectrum and New England Recovery Center for 23 years. And um, one of the things that that's always struck me um, as I started working in all of the levels of care, kind of beyond outpatient into acute care. And there is no more acute than kind of that, that, you know, withdrawal management or what folks might know as kind of detox, right. As that kind of, you know, um, immediate need. Um, And when, when folks really kind of are um, having the most difficulty is that it's hard on the staff. It's hard to keep staff in that level of care. Um, and it's stressful. It's high burnout. You only have typically five to seven days with someone and you never see someone back unless they're not doing well. Right. So you only see people come back when they're readmitting to the program. And when I think we need to, and I've been saying this for a while, so now I need to kind of figure out ways to do it because I've been saying it for a while is we need to, um, you know, do a better job at getting these recovery stories that start at those most acute level of care back to the staff, right? Um, that that work there because it's a hard spot to to work in, right? When you're you're only seeing people at their most acute when they're super uncomfortable and not really engaging because they're really uncomfortable and in acute withdrawal, um, and um, it, you you don't know that that step actually can end up being their step towards long-term recovery and that you were a part of that. Um, In fact, even on this podcast, we've had multiple individuals who have actually, we didn't even know until we started the conversation that they had been in spectrum programming and had been maybe in multiple episodes um, of, of our most acute levels of care. And now they're like, you know, in long-term recovery and completely flourishing. And, and, you know, it's wonderful for me to hear that, but we need to get it to the staff on the front line somehow, right? We need to somehow kind of feed that information back. And um, I don't know if Dr. Williams, if you had thoughts about kind of organizations that might do that well, or how important that is to kind of really recognize that that step is, is an important piece. um, And they are kind of part of somebody's recovery story. Yeah. I mean, you said it wonderfully, right? But the reality is that, you know, working in settings like this, we do get a front row seat to the devastation and the destruction that drugs and alcohol can cause in people's lives, right? And so, you know, recognizing the kind of toll that takes, but also that every time that person comes back, right, we have to come to the table that like, with the absolute most hope we can dig out that this is going to be the time that they're going to get it because that's the only way it works, right? But that does take a toll, right? And it's hard to not feel like the 18th time they come back to the door that somehow we're not doing enough or, you know, the system isn't doing enough. And, you know, the very real reality is, you know, even through my research, but also, you know, having been a supervisor and working with and talking to people all the time, but we often hear the bad stories, like you said, and we don't often hear enough about the successes. And the truth is we'll never hear them all because we have to have faith that we're planting seeds every day. And you never know, you know, when five years down the road in someone's recovery journey, that that one thing you said to them when you didn't think they were listening, right, is what actually made a difference for them, right? But I do think to keep us, 
you know, excited and motivated, you know, to be able to share those stories, maybe even to, you know, offer opportunities for previous clients to come back and share their stories with clients who are in the program today, with the staff who were there, or maybe, you know, are newer now, but can see that, you know, it does work because it, it does work, right? We just have to have faith in, in the process, right? And realize that even if it's not this time, they walked back out the door with more information and more prepared to take a step in their recovery than before they walked in, right? And that's our goal. The other thing I wondered if we could focus a little bit on is that in, in a way to reduce that stigma is similar to the treatment providers, right? Is is looking for that that hope that this could be that time, you know, this treatment episode is, is helpful regardless of where that person's path goes, but really taking a look at the whole person and not just the overdose, right? And not just um, what what happened at the end of their recovery story, um, and from so from what I understand and share as much as you are comfortable with, um, you know, Laura and Jimmy, but um, you know, J- Justin was um, five months in recovery, right, and helping others in his recovery at the time of his overdose, and that's not an uncommon story and but it's often not what we focus on right we kind of focus on the loss and we paint the picture about the individual solely on that and not on all that wonderful recovery that surrounded it and the, everything else about him is there anything that 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 resonates with you on that yeah i can i can answer that and so i think uh <clears throat> For us, so Justin had gone after after detox to um, a recovery center in central or a, or a rehab center in Central Mass, um, Spring Hill, and we would visit him. I think weekly or every other week or something. And um, it was quite evident that his kind of effect on people in the in this recovery community was like quite significant. He was, you know, leading morning reading sessions of different of uh, of the. T- uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and different poems and, and passages and stuff of that sort. And uh, he seemed to really kind of bring people together uh, around him for different events throughout the throughout his time there. And once he when he did pass away, we we heard from many of these people that he had met through uh, uh, Spring Hill as well as Sober Living, um, people that we even still stay connected with today, uh, how much he helped them as they were kind of side by side going through recovery. Uh, and how much, uh, and, and, and it, it helps because when we see them still do good, we, we can kind of think back and, and remember how Justin helped them as they were kind of going through that journey together. Um, and so that, that's what comes to my mind really, uh, right away when you, when you brought that up. And we hear that so often, don't we, Jesse, about, um, when every time we we talk with someone in the podcast, or of course when we talk with patients in general, um, you know, you really don't know the impact that you're having on everybody around you in that's in treatment with you at the same time, right? Like you don't, you, you know, you you might like you know recognize that it's helpful, it, it's it's helpful for you and your recovery to bring people together, and you know, and you can't keep it unless you give it away. And there's that that's really a very true kind of piece that comes out of a lot of twelve step recovery, but um, we consistently hear from individuals on this podcast and otherwise that, you know, sometimes there's just, you know, one thing that someone did or someone said um, that stuck with them, right? That really, that really helped. Um, and and I just, I really appreciate your ability, um, despite your own pain to hold on to those pieces of Justin, right? To really hold on to the fact that that's still ongoing, right? And for years and years to come, there will be a ripple effect of the impact that he had um, on on others. Yeah. And another thing I'll add too, in terms of, you know, continuing the momentum and continuing the recovery and the hope, um, we held our first um, basketball tournament this past June, um, our first sort of bigger scale fundraiser. Um, We had a really great turnout. It was just incredible. Um, And we met a lot of people that, um, you know, again, there were so many people that came up to us, whether they were in the tournament or just visiting that said, oh, you know, I actually have experience with this through a family member or through another loved one. Um, There was one individual I remember that I think came across uh, a flyer for the tournament in, you know, a coffee shop and, you know, liked basketball and decided, you know, really wanted to sign up. 
and then the certain individual, you know, each of my family members had um, met him and talked to him throughout the tournament. And we had learned that he was also um, two years in recovery, looking to open his own um, sober home. And he just said how connected he felt to um, this, to us as a family. Um, he didn't know Justin, um, but, you know, really felt very motivated um, to continue, you know, with his recovery and with his work in trying to help others as well. And so um, it's the it's the stories like that that, you know, really keep it going and really sort of has that sort of pay it forward mentality um, that will, you know, just continue to bring hope and help um, and, you know, hope, uh, as we mentioned earlier, for others. Well said, Lauren. Very well said. I, I know when I connect with different people at various events or, you know, conferences, and I, I get to know them for the first time, uh, sort of, you know, I get two different things going on in my mind. I, I, I do not sort of, it's, you, you know, one, I'm a person in recovery, and, and it's great that there's this other resource that I'm learning about. To, to help those maybe in a different city or a different state or a different area that maybe that I'm, I'm not too familiar with. And then the other piece is that, you know, doing this work, whether we're teaching it at Assumption University or we're, you know, creating a nonprofit or we're working in acute settings or in leadership roles, you know, we're, we're one piece of a much larger organism that is, is helping those in, in the mission is is to help those who most need it and it, it's you know just so amazing to me to see the help that's going on you know you talk about the basketball uh fundraiser and, and i'm wondering if, if you could just speak a little bit on you know what else that you can see coming up for Mac's mission and and what sort of plans or uh ideas that you have moving forward yeah. Um, so I think at least with the the funds that we've raised from the uh, recent fundraiser that we had, we really want to put um, 100% of those funds towards people that are actively working on their recovery. So um, whether that be, you know, someone who... Um, is going into sober living to detox, you know, a partial hospitalization program. What we found um, when we were working with Justin on his recovery was just the cost of how much um, all of these services cost. And, you know, to us, um, if there's anything that we can do to support that um, for somebody that, you know, doesn't have those funds. And um, that's really what our, our main purpose is what we want to do is be able to provide funds for those who want to um, be working on their recovery, but might not have access to the funds to be able to do so. Um, and each of the steps of the recovery, you know, to us are very important. So we want to be able to um, continue to, you know, find different ways to help others in that aspect. Um, I think also, you know, it, We've also done a lot of work with the homeless. Um, so there's an organization up in Lawrence, the Movement Family, that um, every week they do a dinner for the homeless. And we have, you know, sponsored a couple of those dinners, continue to do so. And you meet so many people um, up there, again, from the community that are really appreciative. Um, we've also done some work with, you know, creating backpacks for um, the homeless population in Boston. Um, so that's something that's also very near and dear to our hearts. Um, I think, you know, a next step for us would be, you know, something like this is to be able to get out and speak to people and, you um, working, you know, within schools or with people of the younger population is definitely something um, that w that is something we want to get into. Um, again, just because of, you know, the younger we can try to educate people on, you know, the impacts of what's out there, um, you know, maybe it would have a, a you know, a greater impact. Um, so that's something that we continue to do in the future. Jimmy, I don't know if I missed anything. No, those are all, those are all really, I think, key to kind of what we're looking to do and, and still getting kind of our, our, a solid kind of foundation and, and, and understanding kind of the lay of the land and, and this kind of network of all these organizations and how we can play our role and, and ultimately bottom line, help people who are trying to uh, get into recovery and, and, and might have trouble accessing it. Um, and so, yeah, keeping, keeping our eyes open for different fundraising opportunities where it could be like something coming up in the holidays or, or potentially other things such as the basketball tournament, which will definitely be an annual thing. I mean, this, this, this 
past one in June went very, very well. And we'd like to kind of grow it and expand it um, to the extent that we can. Um, and so those are really kind of some of our some of our key focuses, I think, in the upcoming year or so. I really appreciate kind of the, some of the direction. One, it's widespread, right? So you're looking with, you know, kind of homeless populations and because we know that that's often where, you know, it doesn't matter where you started, right? And it doesn't, ma- but often that's where individuals you know, who just have no other options kind of end up in that addiction is so prevalent in the homeless population um, in that access to resources to help people is really difficult. Um, but I also appreciate you kind of already having identified some gaps in our treatment system, right? So, you know, there is, you know, there, there's, there's, we've come a long way in Massachusetts, and we continue to probably do this better than a lot of other states, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's a supportive, multi-layer, you know, recovery process for everyone. And often, it's those things like kind of having sober living after you complete treatment, right, or having access to sober living while maybe you're in outpatient care or on medications for opiate use disorder, and all of those things, having that kind of wraparound support around you, there's just, there's not funding for that, right? That's not, you know, a billable service for a treatment provider that can be done, you know, with with insurance funds and those kinds of things. And so, you know, I, I just appreciate the, like, your recognition of kind of some of those those gaps and, and using um, your voice and your mission to, to fill some of that for for some individuals. I think that that's really, um, really, really wonderful. And also, I've just reminded Lisa of, uh, you brought her up already, but Maureen Cavanaugh with her Magnolia Foundation and New Beginnings, that was also something that she would identify before it sort of pivoted into what we now do every Wednesday night with Magnolia Fast Family Support Group where, you know, a, a lot of people in recovery knew Maureen is, you know, oh, she's the the woman who is in charge of the sober living funds. <laughs> and, and just the, yeah, and, and just the hope that that brings, you know, uh, we had someone reach out, you know, a couple of years later uh, looking for her, you know, because she remembered, because, you know, and I think Dr. Williams, you talked about this early on here, uh, planting those seeds, right? We, we never know when we're going to see fruit from that seed grow. But I, I like to always say that no news is good news. So, you know, to your point earlier, Lisa, about someone coming into, you know, withdrawal management and, you know, we only have that person here for a number of days, uh, usually a week, seven days. Uh, and then we don't see that person again. Y- you know, I like to think just the way that I sort of run my self care here is, you know, as long as I don't see that person walking back through those doors for services, they're doing well and they don't need us. And every time I hear one of those stories of recovery and hope, whether it's coming back to tell their story or coming back to work here, you know, that's, that's my story. I I showed up here, uh, life wasn't going so great. And, um, you know, as Lisa said, uh, you know, now I'm in this role of the clinical supervisor at Spectrum ATS. And, you know, there's not a day that goes by where I I don't, you know, recognize that and and just really, um, appreciate that fact that, you know, uh, we do recover and, and there is hope. And, uh, Dr. Williams, you had mentioned earlier, and I'm certainly going to look this up for my own information, but the research that you're doing around this, I'm wondering if you could just tell our listeners a little more of, uh, what exact research that you've been conducting. Sure. So, you know, I've been spending a lot of time talking to practitioners, particularly, you know, licensed counselors in Massachusetts um, about what their experience has been losing a client to opioid overdose, right? What kind of preparation they felt like they had in, you know, graduate school or training that they received, you know, because we have to do continuing education training, and also, you know, what kind of support they felt from their organizations, right? And, you know, as what you would typically expect in terms of the emotional responses, you know, of shocking, grief, and self-doubt. But what, you know, is most, I guess, jarring in a lot of ways was the lack of preparation, right? So the lack of conversations that were happening at the graduate school level ever about <laughs> grieving, and particularly not about grieving the loss of a patient to overdose, right? And then, you know, the complete almost lack of, you know, continued education associated with it, but also the organizational responses. And I would like to think that, you know, having been 
in a field where we know that we're losing clients, that we would have developed better models to be supportive of one another. But what they shared were things like being blamed, right? That most of our models are set up to figure out if we had done something wrong. Did we dot all our I's and cross our T's? That the human element was missing. And not that they didn't feel that there was an important problem of quality assurance, right? And it was important to continue to get better at what we were doing so that we could save more lives. They really felt like no one actually ever asked how they were doing because the reality is we're the caretakers, right? And so we're expected to care. I mean, there were examples of them being asked to go caretake people from other departments, but nobody ever asking how they were doing. You know, in the face of things like having to give Narcan, there never being a conversation in the face of learning that our patients had passed. And also, you know, this concept of grief notifications and how we go about doing that. And are we doing it in a caring way? I mean, they talked about receiving emails and voicemails left on their desk. People walking into meetings and saying, hey, do you know Jim's dad? Right? And just this lack of understanding that these are these are people that we care about deeply and we've worked with for a very long time. They We recognize that there's, some, there's someone's child, that there's someone's brother, that there's someone's sister, and we see right, the good in them. And so being with them on this journey of struggle, right, when unfortunately their journey ends, right, it does affect us. And thinking about, right, how do you tell someone? How do they want to be notified? Do they want to be notified between two patients when they have to go see someone else, right? Do they want to be notified at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day? Would they like you to call them at home or do they want you to wait until they come back to work? I mean, those small things, right, are just this little steps that we can take to say, hey, we understand this matters and we understand it's going to affect you too. How could it not affect us, right? But we don't ever talk about the fact that it will or that these are the experiences that we'll have. And it's so important to, you know, I think that, you know, we we can easily be bogged down as treatment providers with what, 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 who's in front of us, right? Like what's the next thing that we have to do to take care of and have our response be instead of the pause to, you know, and if anybody has ever seen kind of the, um, I, I really like the description that SAMHSA uses and they have kind of a great, we use it at our organization called the pause, right? And it just gives you that space to recognize that person, recognize their strengths, recognize who they were, recognize the impact, right? To take that pause. It's easy to not do that, right? Because there's so many other people that are in need in front of you and, but you have to recognize the impact on, you know, even on the supervisors and the directors, but also on the direct care staff um, and what that impact is. Um, and it's worth that pause because you're not going to be as, as effective supporting the rest of the patients if you don't take that time to recognize it. And so, um, you know, I've actually been part of a lot of training initiatives because you're right, there are not not a lot of continuing education trainings and things like that. Um, you know, we had a, a, a TA subcontract with Boston Medical Center's um, OBAT TTA focused on um, opiate treatment providers because we are definitely on the front lines of this um, epidemic and really focusing on grief and loss specific to our patients. And, um, and really the biggest themes were that permission giving of it's, it's, it, you, it's okay to recognize this. It's okay to recognize this on an individual basis, right. As a team, um, and as a treatment community, right. So whether it's an inpatient residential treatment, I'm sure that there were ripple effects in the programs that that um, Justin was in, right, that all felt that. Um, and but those that were in treatment with him, the, those that treated him. Um, and it's important for us to to actually recognize that that impact and recognize what it can do um, to our to our own selves um, and and treat it like grief and loss, you know, in any other way, right? Like we don't we we don't ask people to ignore grief and loss in other areas of their life. You know, why do we have expectations um, just because it's an, an unfortunately common experience because of the type of work we do, right? Um, and we haven't done well in the healthcare field in general in this, to be honest, right? Like, you know, we are definitely in the front lines of an ep- epidemic um, and seeing it more um, frequently for overdose, but even the medical community doesn't do a great job at recognizing that impact, um, you know, for um, for loss in, in patients. And I think we need to 
we need to do better. And, and I think it's tied to um, the workforce challenges. Right. Um, now, I don't think that will solve our workforce challenges. I think there's lots of other things that come into play, why we don't have enough treating providers um, and why staffing is such a challenge. Um, but I think this is a piece of it, right, that we probably need to recognize and support um, support our staff differently. Yeah, and I'm really glad, you know, Christian and I just connected a couple of weeks ago, but um, listening to, you know, her perspective and being here right now, it's just opened such, you know, one of the things I am grateful for, you know, along this journey for the past few years is, is all that we've learned, um, you know, as to how to help somebody, how to help your family member, how to help a loved one. And you guys are giving a whole new perspective on, you know, something that admittedly I hadn't thought too much about before, but, you know, the provider's perspective and, you know, just dealing with, um, you know, all, all your patients and the loss. It's just, it's really, you know, putting things into perspective. So I really appreciate that. Even with this, you know, we're hosting an awareness awareness day and I, you know, put out my email and said, if you want to send me a picture of your loved one, right? Send me a picture of your loved one. And I've gotten hundreds of pictures of loved ones and opening those emails is painful, right? I mean, the, the reality is that it's it's painful. Right? And so, you know, I think, you know, you said a really, a lot of really important things, Lisa, it's how do we normalize this, right? The reality is that we do feel, right? It's okay for us to feel. And when we can have conversations about we're most effective when we talk about this, right? When we work together, when we you know, the most effective people that you know, the clinicians in my research have talked about are people who said, I've been through this too, right? I understand it, right? I've been there. It does hurt, right? And we can take a moment to sit in that space, right? The building of opportunities to grieve the way that providers felt the need because we recognized it as grief and we said, it's okay, right? You should be grieving. You did work with this person. You did care about them. You should have. And so, you know, thinking about how we continue to you know, earlier, you know, Jesse, you made a point about how you keep hope, right? You say you know, the reality for you is no news is good news, right? And it's what allows you to say, I'm going to get out of bed and come tomorrow. And I'm going to, you know, believe in the next person who I hope I won't hear anything about because they'll be doing great. Yeah. yeah. And and Lauren, you said that, that you and Dr. Williams just connected a few weeks ago. You know, it it's almost goes without saying, but I, I can see this great need that you know, maybe Mac's mission can fill where, you know, part of that going into schools, not only going into schools at, you know, a, a younger level to talk to kids, but um, I see some graduate school presentations in your future, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're talking to, you know, you're uniquely equipped to talk to graduate students entering the field or maybe just starting on the field about this and, you know, the impact that overdose has had. And, and, you know, you've mentioned the particular treatment center that your brother went to. And I just, I happen to know a, another gentleman um, who unfortunately his recovery story ended in the same way. And, you know, he actually worked at that treatment center and they, they named a, a field after him. Um, oh, wow. And um, I can connect with you on email and put you in touch with that organization as well. And the great work that they're doing in, in memory of Andrew R. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, another situation or, or uh, another gentleman comes to mind who, you know, this is this is not my first experience working at a withdrawal management uh, level of care. I had previously worked at New England Recovery Center's detox, and we had a father who would come in who lost his son to an overdose. And he would come in with a boombox and he would play the music that his son liked and talked about his son to, to carry on his memory. And, and for all the speakers that we had come in, we call them commitments, whether they're from a local mutual aid group or a uh, just a, a one-off, you know, a former patient telling their story recovery. Uh, consistently, that gentleman's talk had the, the either the most impact or one of the most impactful where he's talking to our patients who aren't feeling well, who are, you know, here just for a handful of days, but something in that gentleman's story sharing about his son just captured the attention and, and the passion and the, the the memory to live on. So, you know, there there's, uh, I, I agree with you, Lisa, you said it earlier, you know, I think we're, we're doing um, thankfully a lot more than some other places 
for those of us in addiction and in recovery and, and getting the help out there, but there's more work to be done. And one of the nice things that you just said, Lauren, which kind of brings us in some ways full circle, you talked at the beginning too about finding purpose, right, for and having something good come out of this loss. And I think that's something that we can think about for providers too, right? It's why, you know, there's so much interconnection, but, you know, getting connected with organizations like yours and being able to be a part of something that you're doing or being able to have a field named after someone, being able to see that remembrance happens and that we too can have purpose moving forward, right? The trainings that you're doing at Spectrum, right? Seeing, okay, right, this did happen, but we're doing something with this, right? We're giving something to it. I mean, I think we all are searching for ways to find purpose, right? Beyond just the work that we're doing every day. And, you know, organizations like Maca's Mission do help us to do that, right? It helps us to see that there is right, good coming of these situations that we can be a part of too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think the other theme to kind of, kind of, again, kind of just you know, wrap us, wrap us up as we come to the end of this really important but challenging topic, is connection. Um, and I think I've heard that so continuously, really clearly from Jimmy and Lauren about the need for kind of connecting to others. That great description of the individual at the basketball game, right? That's all examples of connection and our treatment providers need that too. And so one of the other trainings we just, I just recently did in partnership with UMass's trauma team um, and Drs. Latina Costova was recognizing that this is all often trauma responses on behalf of our treatment providers. And of course, uh, uh, our family and loved ones. Um, And that what really doesn't work right for for managing that is the fight, flight, or freeze, right? We're not kind of a, you know, a, a tiger on the, you know, <laughs> you know, trying to like, you know, hide from the other animals or attack. Like we, do, that's not as helpful. And that when we need to heal as humans, we're actually built for the affiliate response, right? And that's what actually helps us. And really, another way of saying that affiliate response is just connection. Mm-hmm. Right. And that ability to connect to others, to have the conversations and remembrances do that. Right. Remembrances create connection. And so I guess one of the things I'd, I'd like to kind of wrap us up with um, today is that idea of, you know, on August 31st this year um, or as in the days leading up to overdose awareness. Um, I encourage folks to kind of find ways to make remembrances and connections uh, related to those that we have lost. Um, And so I hope everybody takes care of themselves um, and takes care of those around them as we prepare for this. And as Jesse said, we are going to, you know, it's always interesting to me that the gear shift that goes from remembrance of loss on August 31st to September 1, yay, recovery month. Um, but we are going to celebrate that too, right? So let's take that connection and recognition and remembrance into, um, you know, the, the positive month of recovery month where we'll be bringing you a podcast a week, um, as Jesse said. Um, does anybody have any anything we didn't talk about that we should? Any last thoughts that you would like to share? as we um, wrap up this important episode. Not really a thought, but just a question we, we ask on almost every podcast uh, about resources. And, and this goes to uh, everyone on here. Um, is there any podcast or book or training or some resource that, that you feel is appropriate or has helped you um, that you would like to share about and tell our listeners? Um, I guess one of the organizations that's helped our family a lot um, is the Family Restored. Um, we started attending their meetings um, while Justin had started his recovery um, and learned that's really where we learned a lot um, about what we can do to support him and it's an organization that we've continued to keep ties with um, and work with in the future Um, but they've been a great organization um, to support families um, who uh, have a loved one that that they are supporting in their addiction Um, and they do also provide you know scholarships for individuals in sober living Um, So to us, that's one um, that's been very helpful and we continue to work with in the future. 
Thank you, Lauren, for that. And Kristen, do you want to share anything about your overdose awareness uh, event next week? Sure. So Assumption is hosting our first ever um, opioid overdose awareness event on August 31st from 4 to 6. We are going to, you know, start with some voices from the community hearing you know, experiences of loss and of recovery. We're going to then move on to a remembrance walk around campus where our goal is to take the 107,622 steps to symbolize each loss that we experienced last year collectively. Um, and then we're gonna have an opportunity to do some conversations informally. Um, the DA's office is coming and bringing their memorial wall. We will have luminary bags. We'll have, you know, walk bibs where you can write the name of your lost loved one that you're remembering that day. We will have a slideshow. So if you'd like to send in a photo, there's still a few days to do that. Please, please feel free to do that. You know, I think at the end of the day, you know, we just want to A, take a minute to remember the lives lost, but B, to also recognize that we can be a part of the solution right? and that each one of us has an opportunity to do something, right? And to, you know, recognize that it's not something outside of us. It's something that we actually have responsibility for and can take action on. Thank you. Thank you very all right. much. Well, I'd like to thank you all so much for being here, taking the time out of your day to share your messages. Um, and you know, thanks, um, you know, Jesse, and um, thanks for everybody for being here in this episode. So look for more announcements if you um, if you want to get updates on our podcast. You know, hit the like, subscribe, all of those things I'm supposed to say about podcasts, <laughs> um, and always forget to um, so you don't miss yeah, our. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. Take care of yourselves. Thank, thank you. For thank you so much. Appreciate it.